Why'd you even marry him? He's such a jerk. Well, Bill has his good qualities. You know, nobody's perfect. And now we have a family. We already had a family. Welcome to the Magic Lantern Podcast, an ongoing informal discussion of the films we love and the things we love about them. I am Erica Long. And I am Cole Rowling. Each episode of The Magic Lantern will be devoted to one film that we alternately select, and we will discuss why it is significant to us. Just a note, whether the film is a classic or a more contemporary title, this will be an in-depth discussion that will include explicit plot details and potential spoilers. We are at episode 136 today, and that's back to Erica's choice. What are we talking about today? I chose Boyhood from 2014, directed by Richard Linkletter, with Patricia Arquette, Eller Coltrane, Lorelai Linkletter, and Ethan Hawke. It was filmed from 2001 to 2013, using the same actors throughout, and it covers the childhood and adolescence of Mason from age 6 through 18. So let me set some background here before we get started. The cast and the crew gathered about once or twice every year, different times, different dates, and they filmed for about three or four days. And the production team itself would then spend about two months in pre-production and one month in post-production every year. When the filming began, both Eller and Lorelai were about seven years old. Ethan Hawke was about 31, Patricia Arquette about 33, and the director Richard Linkletter was about 41. When they got started, there was no completed script. Linkletter said he had a general storyline in mind, and that didn't change through the course of the filming. He would write year to year, and everybody contributed in the process, and you would often then see stories that reflected things happening in their own lives. And particularly for Eller, the uh, titular boy in boyhood, Linkletter would try to reflect what his concerns and life were at the time, what he was doing, what he was going through. And then both Ethan Hawke and Patricia Arquette based their characters on their own parents. Hawke's father was an insurance agent who was divorced and remarried. Patricia Arquette's mom became a psychotherapist much later in life. This one is interesting to me because it's unlike a lot of the films that we've covered so far. This is a contemporary film that was written about extensively at the time. And out of our previous 135 episodes, we've only covered 16 films from the year 2010 onward. And out of all of those, only one comes close in terms of dominating the conversation during its release cycle. That was Get Out. And then I think only one is similarly universally acclaimed, and that's Shoplifters. All my choices, by the way. <laughs> You're welcome. Well, it's very true. Boyhood specifically is one of only a handful of films to receive a meta score on Rotten Tomatoes of 100, obviously the highest possible critical score you could get. And it won a ton of awards too. One of the most significant things that it was called was the eighth best film of the 21st century so far by the New York Times. That's a really big deal. And you may remember Patricia Arquette won Best Supporting Actress at the Academy Awards. It won a bunch of Golden Globes. Linklater got the Silver Bear at the Berlin Film Festival. So it is very critically lauded. Now, I remember when we went to see this in the theater, and I was wondering if you could kind of reflect back, too, on what you felt when it came out. And I want to come back to the question at the end of the episode to see how revisiting it has been, because I didn't come back to the film during all of that time before we started watching it again for this episode. Well, I really like having a film that gives me so much stuff to wrestle with. And during the course of this discussion, it may seem like from time to time that I am not wholly fond of it, but nothing could be further from the truth. I rated it four and a half stars out of five the day that we walked out of the theater, and I still rate it as such. It's not perfect, but I do love it, even though the movie and I have to go to separate corners sometimes, which I think is a much more valuable experience than a lot of cases where a movie is easy to love and doesn't push you at all. I don't want it that easy. That bores me. And also, you don't want to give it a pass just from a nostalgic standpoint either, I'm guessing. No, not at all. So it's a good thing there's plenty here to dig into. 
So are you ready to get started? Absolutely. We kick off the film with Coldplay. That's the song Yellow. And it seems like right away, Richard Linklater is using music to set the mood and the period of time as we get to know Mason Jr. and his mom, Liv. She's picking him up from school and she's kind of trying to understand this kid logic a little bit. He's talking about where wasps come from. And we see their small family, his big sister and his mom trying to navigate that single mom territory, dating and then also being a parent. And so specifically, I want to talk about music and these other time markers that Richard Linkletter uses. A big one here is reading the second Harry Potter book. Later on, we'll also see setting up Obama election signs and talk of whether there'll be another Star Wars movie. What do you think about the choices he's made in terms of which touchstones he's chosen? I know some people don't like this, but I love the insertion of the news and current events to ground this movie. And that's a very specific choice. A lot of filmmakers, they will studiously avoid anything that dates their movie whatsoever. But I love that Linklater embraces it. And he's right to do so, I think, because a quote-unquote generic bookstore event doesn't work on our collective memory the same way as a Harry Potter midnight release does. And you can especially see it in that one little girl who is so giddy to get her book Nothing else was happening in the zeitgeist with kids' literature that way. I have to say, I was probably 15, almost 20 years older than that little girl, and I was just as excited. (laughs) And his sister waking him up with, oops, I did it again, that will never not be funny to me. (laughs) Well, there are a lot of these things, especially the Harry Potter thing. These are things that a kid would remember, specifically, which I think is the main criteria for anything that shows up in this movie. Now, more specifically about the music... Do you think that the music cues were supposed to reflect the less sophisticated taste of kids and what they were hearing in their environment, or just specifically to evoke the early 2000s? It seems like to me we're talking about music here that exists in modern radio play, and it would also be age appropriate because it's not stuff that's particularly challenging following his age, he's going to get into more challenging things as he gets older. Yeah, I think they're specifically time markers too. Because you're right, there are more nuanced and sophisticated musical nods. Later, you hear Wilco. My favorite thing being the Towns Van Zant poster that's in the house that Mason Sr. shares with Charlie Sexton. But here in the beginning, when we get Coldplay and Blink-182 and Sheryl Crow, I think it's very much putting us in a specific time and place. It reminds me more of my musical education with my mom just always having the radio on. So let's come back to that naughty big sister for a second. That's Samantha. And she's the one who's giving her mom so much grief. They've got the first of their big moves coming up because Liv is going to go back to college and Mason Jr. is worried, is dad going to be able to find us? And Samantha says, I'll never like mom as much. Yeah, there are a lot more threads going on here than just Mason Jr. I think the title is a little restrictive in retrospect. It's too specific because the movie is much more about this span of time than the process of Mason specifically passing from childhood to manhood. For example, it's even as much about motherhood as anything. That's an even more subtle transformation and struggle, I think. You could easily make the argument that Patricia Arquette is the linchpin here. And it is definitely a good thing it wasn't called girlhood because his sister is rotten. (laughs) I knew you were going to say that. Now, this is an older sister, younger brother, and she's way more aggressive in how she acts out against all the events taking place. The move, these other big changes, and she's at a slightly different time in her life, at least in the film, than her younger brother. But in your life, you're the older brother. Does this still feel like a realistic relationship depiction to you? I guess, but I'm basing that exclusively on how I hear people talk about their own experiences, because it certainly doesn't reflect mine. With what we're shown here, Sam falls much more under that eventually saying, I never really knew my brother umbrella, but she'll never know that she feels that way because she never paid proper attention. She's not equipped to understand that that's her fault. I've never felt 
any sort of separation from my sister that I sense here. I don't have any siblings. I can still appreciate it from the standpoint of the snotty daughter who takes out her anger on mom. I will say that was me. I was a huge asshole when we moved <laughs> across country and probably continue to be in many other years of my life. You would think any 13-year-old would want to go to Idaho, wouldn't you? Yeah, right. You would. Maybe in 1840. Well, we're moving forward in time, as we do inexorably in this movie. We've got the morning school rush, and Dad, Mason Sr., is back in town. There's clearly some tension here with his mother-in-law because she really references the situation as single parenting, meaning he is not involved. But this is his time with the kids, and so it's this free-flowing, building a relationship kind of a scene. Going bowling with bumpers, which is something I know you can appreciate from our friend Chelsea. Another of those kind of time markers talking about the events in Iraq. And wondering if he's going to be moving back here. Now, he's also trying to explain some of this, some of these years that have gone by, his absence, what happened between he and their mother. When he drops the kids back home, clearly, Liv is mad. He's a disruption here. So again, we're talking about kind of epic things, at least to me. Epic relationship elements, the passage of time, really complicated relationships. And so for a film that took 12 years to make, and it's all reflected on screen, it seems like that this is really an epic in scale, in terms of span of time, life events that are addressed. And it strikes me, though, that at the same time, it's filmed in a pretty straightforward manner without a lot of showy flashes. So if this is sort of a small scale epic, how does it compare to something like The Leopard, say, or The Up series, which is another thing it's compared to? Is it inappropriate of me to call it an epic? I don't know if it's inappropriate. Everyone has their own measure for that. But to me, epic has a connotation of sweeping grandeur that this doesn't have. It's too understated, very intentionally, to be called a powerhouse, I think. Instead, it's made of layer upon layer of these fine little observations. You mentioned the leopard. I see this more as the influence of Bresson and Ozu. Maybe some neorealism thrown in there. And I think ticket sales sort of bear that out too. It earned more internationally than domestically. That's a very art house kind of box office performance. So in keeping with this idea that I have, this kind of small scale epic or whatever it is, how does it compare to this other series that was also a gigantic undertaking? That's the Before Trilogy. It spans 18 years. I think of them as apples and oranges. It's a different focus entirely. In this case, with the child's perspective, bringing different elements out in Linklater's writing. I think that's the most important part of all that. I really like this approach that you referred to earlier to writing this story that was less about specific actions on a given day and more about what Eller was feeling or grappling with. Another thing that I like about this presentation, the way this film uses time that's different from those other films, is that it illustrates much more clearly just how long certain processes take. The example that I'm thinking of in particular here is class mobility and what a long grind that is for Liv to move just one level up at a time. How long that takes. Well, that process does take a huge amount of time. And clearly, the kids are aware of it. They're living it at the same time especially the changes in schools, the changes in her job, in her own education. And the kids, especially Samantha, make it clear that they remember those arguments more than the good times. They're saying this to their father as well. So do you think that this is a mark of childhood or just their childhood or something that's more reflective of general human behavior? Again, this is one of those things that I never experienced directly, so I don't have a one-to-one -one relationship with how these kids must feel. And it's so hard to say what will be memorable, though I would assume traumatic events seem like they would naturally rocket to the top of that list, especially once the stepdads start coming into play. There's a distinct feeling of, I can't wait until I'm old enough to get out of here, which I know I felt... And not because of anything negative going on, just because I wanted to get on with my life the way I wanted to do it. But man, I can't imagine dealing with 
fucking suitors and stepdads in all of movie history, when these characters are introduced, has your first inclination ever been, now there's a cool guy I'm going to like all the way through. Oh my gosh, they definitely cast for eyebrows, and <laughs> eyebrows tell you a lot. Just like I've gone on record before saying, if you have a beard and no mustache, clearly you are Satan. And it really is, I think, a testament to the strength of biology that we still instinctively give so much more leeway to the shitty rogue absentee father above the most seemingly legit stepfather. Well, I can tell you for me, the bad times, they cut deeply, and I remember a lot of them. When I'm thinking about things just on my own, my own experiences, I remember so many of those good times more than anything. But there are a lot of things that were still special to me that I will never forget. My mom taking me out of school for a surprise trip to the movies. My dad and I going to the science museum. What did you go see on that trip? Uh, the Wrath of Khan. <laughs> Not my choice. Awesome. <laughs> Tons of great days with my aunts. Fun times with my grandmother, Evelyn. But yeah, those bad times, they don't go away. So, like me, you never had to deal with this instance of a third party, an interloper, or a stepdad. Yes and no. There is one memorable experience with my Aunt Katrina, actually. Apparently, when I met her first husband, Jerry, the first thing I said was, I don't like you. <laughs> I don't know how old I was, probably before age six, and I was proved correct. He was a scumbag. So speaking of scumbags, <laughs> it seems like, though, this first of Liv's romantic choices after Mason Sr. is not a terrible guy. This is Bill the Professor. He's got a nice house. He has really sweet kids. And when we see them all together, this is a really positive representation of a blended family. Because, by the way, they've already gotten married. We don't really have any information about him. He doesn't seem like a monster right away. Everybody seems comfortable and happy with the arrangement. His kids call Liv mom, and they seem really genuine with that. But, quickly, that's followed by the signs of Bill's excessive drinking and him being exclusively really hard on his own son, Randy. So, what does this tell us? about Liv's decision-making in that department. Is this an instance that we discussed with other things together, other films that we've watched, that the revealing of someone's true psychology is easier to miss when you're around them every day? It's more gradual. Yeah, there's definitely something to be said for that, you being the lobster in the pot, not realizing that the water temperature is going up. But I think more importantly, it lays bare some of the transactional nature of what's happening here. We never see a hint of romance or satisfaction on her part in these arcs. They're all framed as finding a partner for child rearing, and she thinks she's doing the right thing by ignoring her needs and focusing on providing for the children. But in the long run, would it have been more successful if she had been a little more selfish and made those choices, at least partially, based on what made her happy? If the relationship had been more happy and fruitful, based on what she wanted, would they have even ended up in a position like this? I think there's so much to unpack here. There's the financial security. It cannot be overstated, especially when we see where they've come from. She's had to do this all on her own. And also, if we talk about me personally, I can relate to making decisions quickly without maybe giving the background to that decision to everybody else. I do also think about that gradual thing that we talked about. Did she see him relating to his kids much at all before this? How much time did they all spend together beforehand? And his aggressions really do get worse over time. It's not all at once. And Bill here does have some moments of fatherhood teaching them to play golf, trying to set some boundaries, which is helpful, having kids do their chores, but... As Liv says, he has so many lines. Everything has to be done exactly the way he wants it done, when he wants it done. And those chores one day get interrupted by a visit from their dad. This is the regular visit. And he's taking them through Houston. And this drive through Houston looks so familiar to me, and it just makes me smile. And later on, he and Mason Jr. have a trip to one of the state parks. I realize it's Pedernales State Park, where you and I have been many times. 
again, another one of my favorite things about Linklater's films. I like seeing and hearing about all these Texas places. It makes me want to get out and go drive and go swimming and have barbecue. It's just another huge benefit to having a filmmaker be so in tune with his surroundings. No one can shoot New York like Scorsese. No one can shoot Texas like Linklater. When we can go to a baseball game again one someday. Day. <laughs> I also really like here that the kids are countering his attempts to draw them out in conversation beyond just that kid, everything's fine. And they ask him to actively reciprocate with actual details about his life and his thoughts and his feelings. Do you think he's able to reciprocate? Do you think it comes out in his music? Well, to kind of establish where we are in their relationship, Dad had the luxury, and I'm putting that in huge quotes, of being able to take some time for himself. He basically just went off and did his own thing. Yeah, to Alaska, so he can't get further away, really. So... I think he knows how he'd like it to feel, and he's on the right track, but he's only beginning to get there. And that's why a child's intellect can be positioned as an equal and opposite force to his. And I think it certainly comes out in his music. Sometimes that's the only way that folks can accurately convey those feelings. And Charlie Sexton, I think, is the perfect foil for this. If you know anything about Austin and Texas music, he definitely makes this feel more like Austin than Houston, which is where they're supposed to be. That poster of Towns Van Zant could put it technically in either place. You've either got the Cactus Cafe here or the old quarter in Houston. But if you don't know Austin well, this is a place where you can come and evade adult responsibilities for a long time. Maybe forever. It is a velvet pillow for Peter Pans to land on. And I think, interestingly, Mason Jr., he's got that instinct in him a little bit. In this sleepover, he is showing that desire for magic beyond what is readily observable or available. He's not satisfied with a life that doesn't have room for creativity and imagination. And he's only eight. And I think Mason Sr. is a great inspiration for being able to maintain your inner child for better or worse. Because I guarantee you, when we finally go to Iceland, there will be elves. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I think... Wait. Are you just saying that just because we watched that Eurovision movie with Will Ferrell? A little bit from column A, a little <laughs> bit from column B. Well, I do think that this parental guidance or this parental role that he feels that he has comes out in his music less through his talk. And I like also, I feel like this is on purpose. I think the song that he's made at this stage, it sort of feels simplistic to a certain degree, because I think that he is starting to get into his music. He's not this accomplished guy. Charlie Sexton doesn't come off as a rock god at this point. It feels like where he should be and what he should be saying. Funny that you say that, because I am really interested in how people perceive the charisma of Charlie Sexton, because for me, he has been around forever. And I do think of him as very much a permanent, legendary fixture on the Austin, Texas music scene. When I say that, I think about how he looks here and how he looks at the end of the movie. Mm, okay. It seems like two different musicians. He's grown into that. I think it's really actually kind of perfect. And I do feel like it's on purpose. And by the way, I got to shake Charlie Sexton's hand once. Super nice guy. Yeah. Every time I ever did sound for him at Waterloo or anything like that, same thing. Super sweet guy. So at this point, I was actually making a note for myself that it seems like we've seen way more of Bill and the kids or the kids themselves, less kind of mom time happening. And just at that moment, that's when Mason gets that forced haircut and he's looking to live for comfort and also to answer that incredibly important question, why did you marry him? And really the underlying question, didn't you know he was a jerk? Why did you bring him here? Because now there is a huge transition that's happening. He has seen... Mason Jr., I mean, has seen the aftermath of domestic violence perpetrated against his mom, and then it gets turned on he and Randy. Bill's on a downward spiral, obviously, and we have that kind of infamous drunk driving scene. I remember talking about this and reading about it a lot at the time. It's filmed in a way that I think we as viewers are tuned to expect that something terrible is going to happen, but then it doesn't. Did it strike you that way then? What about now? And 
What strikes me now is that we've actually seen two really terrible, violent acts. Liv getting hit and the kids getting glasses thrown at them, but it doesn't strike me in the same way as the driving scene. Those driving scenes always have me just waiting for tragedy to come screaming in through the driver's side window as the camera is pointed that way. Doesn't happen. There's a big one in singles. Yeah, there's one at the end of No Country for Old Men as well. But I think the thing out of all of this stuff that you're talking about that cuts me the most deeply out of that entire section is that terrible feeling of needing help and being an imposition on someone. The indignity and the embarrassment and the helplessness of that is the worst part. It's more terrible than all of these other things put together as far as what I imagine. Having to rely on her friend, basically, to extract them from that situation when it's not the friend's responsibility. Of course, she's happy to do it, but that doesn't matter in terms of how you feel inside having to receive this charity. I think that underscores what I've been feeling. The more I think about it, and I've been thinking about it a lot, it does seem like that we disregard the domestic violence more quickly. I guess I go back to that idea of the gradual progression of things. The car accident on one hand feels like a permanent quick end if it all goes wrong. But the domestic violence is just potentially never ending. Do you think that we feel it less because against her it's never specifically demonstrated? We only see the aftermath. Would it make more of an impact if we saw the actual event happen? I think it would, and that's sort of an odd thing to think about from a psychological standpoint. It should be enough that we see her on the floor and crying, and we know what's happened to her. It should be enough that we see glass breaking on the table. I will say the thing that I feel guilty about is this choice to leave Mindy and Randy behind. It makes me feel good that she says she called their mom and Child Protective Services, but that look on their faces is the thing that I don't forget, and I think about what will become of them. It's a heartbreaking concept for me, and it's one that doesn't get resolved in the course of the film. I think that speaks most to a thing that I read about memory films in general and how this film works within that framework. You don't get to choose what you remember. Memories are what haunt you. I think my hair just stood up <laughs> on end. Because as far as Mindy and Randy, there's nothing she can do. That's the lot they've drawn, unfortunately. She cannot be responsible for everyone. Well, we're closing one chapter in Liv's romantic life, and we're seeing more of Mason Sr.'s romantic life. There's a woman friend. Maybe it's his girlfriend. We don't really know. But it gives him a chance to talk about how he wished he had been a better parent and to really set the context for them. He was 23 years old. It's really young. And you mentioned earlier, we tend to give a pass to this guy more than everybody else. What do we think about him in terms of his parenting skills? How about in terms of being an adult in his own right? Well, to start with, I think just the egoism of naming your child after you, I think that's illustrative. And I think at this point, his parenting skills are largely theoretical, having honed them in the vacuum of Alaska with no kids around anywhere. I do admire this impulse that he's feeling to want to get it together now, but his parenting skills and his own adulthood are both still in their larval stages for a good portion of this movie, I feel like. I don't attribute that to any ill intent, but good-natured selfishness can do a lot of damage too. Because the kids only keep growing up. They don't stall in time while he does. And it does really seem like he's always trying. But he comes off a bit more like a babysitter than anything, at least in the beginning. And I really do feel let down by some specific moments, like when he doesn't have cash on him later on to give to Liv, or when he talks about how terrible women are when he's trying to comfort Mason. That was the exact scene I was thinking of when he was talking about leaving that girlfriend behind going to college. But that speaks to something that I think we'll get into a little bit later. The fact that this film and the way it approaches time, it's showing us we're all constantly still growing up. At least hopefully, right? Right, exactly. Well, we're getting into some big transitions here for everybody. Liv is teaching. Sam can drive at this point. Mason is starting to acknowledge girls. Talking with them as friends, but also possibly 
as a member of the opposite sex. He has some appeal, but he seems like he's at the pre-sex stage at this point. And unfortunately, we've got Liv being drawn to another new man, fucking Jim and his dumb fucking stories and eyebrows and his story of mutual <laughs> respect. And I hate that guy. He definitely has one of the greatest punchable faces of the screen season of 2014. Well, the thing here I like is that it's equitable and that it exhibits the truth, like I just said, that growing up is something that we're all doing all the time. It doesn't specifically push, for example, this propaganda that adults have it all figured out and kids should therefore obey. And even though he's a crud, I do like this inversion of professor involved with student with Liv repeating the cycle from the first new husband, just on the other side of it now. And Mason hits a big landmark here. It's a big birthday. And he gets some very specific mementos. The gun, the Bible. He doesn't get the car that he feels like his father promised him. But he's growing up. He does get that really important mix album that his dad has made. It's what he calls the Black Album for his 15th birthday. The best of the Beatles, but just their individual solo work, all specifically curated just for him. And by the way, Ethan Hawke made this in real life for his daughter to deal with the breakup of his marriage. Is there anything a good mixtape won't cure? If there is, I haven't found it yet. <laughs> now, I never really got anything like that for birthdays or specific special occasions that I can remember. I did get a VW Bug that cost $500 when I was able to drive at 16, but nothing else really like that. Did you get any of those sort of special momentous gifts? Well, I was born at the end of October, so the Halloween theme was always more important than specific milestone gifts. As long as we had spooky stuff for my birthday, didn't care about anything else. Halloween Trapper Keeper? Exactly. Halloween Compass? Everything. And this was Oklahoma, not Texas. It's not a Texas rite of passage without guns and God. One thing I did relate to, though, in terms of having neat stuff, was Mason having that collection of arrowheads and all these other trinkets that he had accumulated over the years that were awesome. Did you have a collection of cool stuff like that? No. I had my movie posters that nobody else was interested in, especially not at that age or any other age. But just nothing else cool like that. I didn't really keep anything that much in that same way. My dad did give me a cool flint when I went away to college. That was pretty fun. Oh, and I do have a little bowl with all the shells that I've collected, and I'm just going to keep building on that. Since we're here in Texas, we need to clarify seashells, not shotgun shells or anything like that. Yes, thank you. And I did also, though, keep all of my movie ticket stubs forever. I did that for years, up until I was probably 21, and then I got rid of them. Well, when I was a young Mason's age, I cut out the middle of a copy of my Hardy Boys book, Mystery of the Disappearing Floor, and I kept all of my most prized possessions tucked in that thing. That is the coolest thing I have ever heard in my life. We're talking about, you know, super duper secret. You open up the book, you think it's a book, but there's the square cut out yeah, of it. Yeah, exactly. And in there I had my 1942 and 1945 pure silver half dollars that I got from my great grandpa. It was awesome. The gun that shot Hitler, things like that. <laughs> <laughs> that is truly awesome. If you had made me one of those on our first date, I would have locked it down way <laughs> earlier than I did. Well, speaking of locking it down and rites of passage here, we see a couple of cool examples that I think we should make note of. Hanging out with the older kids. This is a big deal. Even if they are Neanderthals, basically. It seems like his cousins, which he doesn't have cousins. Yeah, exactly. This is top flight cousining. I'm surprised they're not listening to Black Sabbath on headphones. And then food service jobs. That is a rite of passage and the Wild West all at once. You did have those, right? Multiples of those. I was a busser for two days, I think. But <laughs> I was a barista for a long time, at least a year plus. Yeah, have done a ton of that stuff. So you're intimately familiar with what kind of things happen in the walk-in. Yes, for me, it was just the place I would go to cool off. But <laughs> probably other people were doing awesome stuff. Mason, at this point, is showing something that he's really interested in, that he's come to himself, and that's photography. And we see him at school, in the darkroom, on his own, and his teacher gives him a pretty hard time. It feels really awkward to me, and pretty 
contrived from a dialogue standpoint. This whole, who do you want to be, Mason? Did anybody ever put something like that to you in those terms? And I don't know if it's the actor or the writing or both. It's just way too on the nose for me. I think I'd be more likely to deliver that speech than actually receive it. I can see that. I did have one great teacher in high school, Mr. Charles, our English teacher, that I guess you could say was hard on people. To me, this being hard on him, this is a line that is so subjective. If you've ever played a team sport, for instance, and had a coach, say Texas football, this is not being hard on anyone. It's very true because the hardness is do your work, get your assignments done. It's the awkwardness of this whole, you're not special, there are people who are going to work harder than you, on and on, that feels a little sort of lost on a 16, 17-year-old. I disagree, because I think it fits in here based on what I said earlier. I think the connective tissue of all this, the characteristic that each scene of Mason's has, is that it's something that this particular kid would look back on as a distinct memory. So that's why I think it's included here. It was important for him in some way, so it makes the cut. It's the things that he had no interest in that are excised from memory, or at least not featured. That makes a ton of sense, and I'm so glad you said that. And it gives me something to look forward to again when I watch it, that different lens that is really fun and important. Well, Mason is getting all sorts of feedback from a lot of different people about what college will or should mean to him about who he is or will become or is expected to be. It's a whole lot of college will be transformative or it won't be or you will find your people there or do you want to be weird all the time? So where do you, Cole, think the truth lies? I think at this time in his life that's in front of him, it's important, but it's not the be all end all, especially for a kid like him. A lot of things are just going to come much later to a kid like this. You still have to go through it, though. He'll have to learn lessons about decisiveness or lack thereof, about his work ethic and being a flaky artist and what concessions he's willing to make to strike a balance. You have to go through your ponderous teenage musings, which are the fucking worst, but you have to do it. No one can tell you about it. You can't read about it. You just have to do it. It's so true, and I had one of those thrust upon me when the person was maybe 30 years old, and I thought, didn't you get this out of your system? <laughs> <laughs> but no. So yeah, I think it's important, but for Mason specifically, no more or less important than any other step along the way. I think that's what the movie's trying to tell us. Just more of these layers and layers and layers of moments that he's going to pull from and build his own reality. I had really big expectations for my transition to college, and it's something that you expressed earlier, this idea of finally being able to be on my own. And I think for the most part, it did feel pretty momentous, and I didn't look back from that point. Do you feel like it was proportionately more important that period of time than any other period of time? Not now. Because I was still the same person. I did find some of my people, and I realized I continue to find some of my people. And some of those folks drop away as you go. Sometimes you regain them. I think in general, you find your people wherever you are if you're paying attention and if you want to. But dang, at 44, it just feels like a blip <laughs> at this point. So now you find yourself more closely aligned with Mr. Wood, his restaurant boss, instead? Yes, I am now giving people pep talks as well and using the word kid or say, I, I see something in you. I believe in you. I love that guy, Mr. Wood, his restaurant boss, by the way. That's Richard Robichaux is the actor. I love, most of all, that he gives him the savings bond at his graduation party. I think Mr. Wood is a great example of a cautionary tale, is how I feel about it. If you're paying attention, you are often given this gift in life of the example of what you want to avoid, which is just as valuable, if not more so, than examples of how you want to be. Well, speaking of that, we also see how Mason Sr. and Liv have changed or not changed in terms of their relationship, their co-parenting, their own adulthood at this graduation party, because he's come with his family. And everybody's behaving nicely to each other. But this is the moment I said earlier, he doesn't have the cash to help her out for this party expense. So what, if anything, has changed between them, do you think? I think the thing that is said here that is most important and maybe the lesson that I take most from this whole thing, the way I think 
about the Pope of Greenwich Village and nothing ever hurts like you think it will. The equivalent for that in this stretch here, the lesson that is most true and sad and helpful all at once, is that you get older, you don't feel as much. What I really take away from this, the touch that I like so much, is that he specifically takes the time to say, you've done a great job, which is appreciated, but she doesn't have the same reflection back to him. So we're just left with her face (laughs) to contemplate what she thinks about his contributions to the people their kids have become. And the kid that Samantha has become is, how am I supposed to do laundry sitting at the table here at dinner? She still sucks. My hands won't work. (laughs) I just, they're too heavy. I've got these two sacks. Whatever. Yeah, she's terrible. Okay, are we about to do a little bit of a record scratch here? We've got a contentious scene to discuss. Yeah. That's what I meant when I said they're at the table. They're at a specific table in a restaurant when probably the most divisive scene for filmgoers in general regarding this movie takes place. And this is a callback to a scene much earlier. Sometime before they had their septic system worked on and Liv told the septic system guy, you should really be in school. So let's fast forward. We're at this table and this guy is now the manager. He did go to school. He's doing well. And he specifically takes the time to come over to the table. He's recognized Liv and he says, thank you. Or that's the essence of what he says. And that really to the kids, you should listen to your mom. She's smart. I think you're papering over a little bit because it's not just thank you. It's you changed my life, which I think is a much more important thing that's being communicated here. You're absolutely right, because I have a very specific memory of this. I really thought that it was one of her students coming back up to her as I thought about it over the years. So I've made up this false memory in my head. I think because at the time, we talked about sort of a similar thing happening with teachers we may have had when we come back to them as adults. And I'll let you take it from here. Well, the thumbnail test that I try to apply in a case like this is... If you can't remember their name, if they even have a name, then that is a prop, not a character. So, is it irresponsible then to frame this movie as the ultimate film in terms of reality, normality presented on screen because of the lack of diversity and the use of these other characters as props like this? That character appears twice, once doing manual labor and once to thank her for changing his life. Because of the casting decision, the unfortunate subtext now is, what would we do without this white lady helping Latinos reach their potential? I don't think it was malicious on Linklater's part, certainly. I think just tone deaf. And I do think it is interesting in one respect that it shows what is a pivotal moment in someone else's life is virtually unrecallable for the other person involved. And on top of everything else, it not meaning a single thing to her kids. They're completely indifferent to this exchange, it seems like. While I do think this would have registered for me in that particular instance, sitting at the table, I can freely admit I was definitely this kid in certain other ways. I didn't want to go to graduation. I had to be forced to go to graduation. Didn't have the letter jacket, left home for school, and haven't really looked back in all of this time, because isn't that what you're supposed to do? Go out and live your own life? I'm certainly not hanging on to artifacts, especially those that I have either evolved beyond or don't mean anything to me anymore. And other people really take it personally when you aren't as nostalgic the same way that they are. They have no capacity to understand, for instance, that their insistence that their offspring perpetuate their methods is equally burdensome. For instance, just in terms of our personal life here, in seven years now, how many photos do we have together? We took our own pictures in the backyard when we got married, and I don't think we've done anything since then. Just for the podcast. We have the one photo that we use for the podcast. right, right. Which is now pretty old, and I don't think I look like that anymore. But do you feel the lack of them? Well, uh, full disclosure, I take pictures of you when you're asleep with the dogs, (laughs) because they're super duper cute, and I hang on to them when I need a little uplift sometimes. But I'm not walking around thinking, oh, I wish I had more pictures of you and I together. That, though, in large part is because I don't like having my own picture taken because I look like Ted Kennedy. (laughs) Well, I feel like I just don't need them the same way. I carry what I want or need inside me. 
And when I walk into someone's house that is covered with that sort of thing, all I can think is, what are you trying to demonstrate with this? What is this doing for you? I think a lot of it, like a lot of other things, and some things we're about to talk about coming up, it's just what you're taught that you're supposed to do, and people seldom ask why or if they really even need it or want it. Do you want someone to have to come in here and plow through boxes and boxes of pictures and greeting cards and every scrap from a lifetime's worth of interaction when we're gone? No, you know the answer to that question for me. I'm practically ready to throw things out when they're still in our hands. <laughs> I'm just done with that stuff, in part because my mom feels like a little bit of a hoarder or a lot bit of a hoarder. And I think that that's the fate that awaits me personally. Though I would love to hear from other people who do maybe collect things like this. What uh, does it give you? Does it give you special memories? Is it something that you hold on to? Are there some things you hold on to in terms of pictures or mementos more than others? That is interesting, though, now that I think about it, what you were saying about taking photos of me and the dogs, because I assume that's on your phone. This device that we carry around with us all the time, does that eliminate the need for the traditional entryway stairwell surrounded with pictures everywhere? Because now people can take them instantly and carry them with them everywhere. That doesn't seem to be the case with all the advertisements that I regularly see locally for photographers to do special shoots. I honestly, I see this stuff all the time. It still seems like people have the above the mantle photos. That also makes me realize I haven't been in a new person's house in probably two years or more. That's true. And we also don't have matching denim outfits, which <laughs> I think is maybe a key to that. But I digress. But we're at this big scene another big scene probably the one that was on patricia arquette's awards reel the i thought there would be more everybody's out of the house at this point mason is heading to school Liv is now in her apartment by herself for the first time ever as an adult possibly and it's culling through these items that she's kept and really this larger question that She's made sacrifices. And does he realize that? And I don't know that he thanks her for those sacrifices and she resents him for it. And it's something I could relate to. My mom keeping all of these things and me not caring about them. I still say, though, this moment really got me in the first viewing in the theater after all this time has gone by. I felt the weight of what she feels. And Eller also really expresses this moment beautifully. He's reflected on this after the fact, and he says that it was really a turning point for him. It was a really tender moment. It made him recognize the vulnerability of his own parents, seeing them as just people. How does that whole scene and that sentiment strike you now? I think this may be the point at which our opinions most diverge. This is the scene that I am the second most disconnected from. May I suggest that if you got into the parenthood game for all the accolades you may have chosen poorly? <laughs> That's true. Maybe don't put so much stock in these socially manufactured milestones. The film knows it, even if she doesn't, because you notice we don't see weddings, we don't see graduation ceremony. I just thought there would be more, seems like the song of people who bought into the party line. Do you think Mason Jr. will be saying that same thing at 40? Let me ask you this question. This is something that Richard Linkletter said when he and Eller were talking about this scene. And he said at one point she did her best, but that seems to signify failure of some kind. But he went on to say this thing that I've been thinking about a lot myself. Who gets our sympathy? The one who tries hardest and comes up a little short? Or the one who doesn't try much but is fun to be around? It's a good question. And I want to make sure now that you make me think of it that I frame this as I'm thinking of this as parenthood, not motherhood. Yeah, very good and interesting distinction. So maybe Mason Jr. will be saying this at 40. His sister definitely will. I can say that she is one more person just like the rest. She is average. I can sympathize with being overtaken in the moment, but I don't sympathize specifically with this lament because she had choices along the way, just like everyone else, regardless of what she's been taught and what she bought into. Think about this. If when you are in the hospital room holding that newborn, I told you that 18 years from now, you're going to be disappointed to the point of lashing out because this perfect baby, this individual human being with an agenda of his own, rightfully so, 
didn't exactly reflect your values and how you think and do things back at you exactly how you wanted, would you be proud of yourself? Yeah, that's a fascinating question. And I even struggle with the word sympathy. Should we feel sympathy at all? Is it, from a performance standpoint, really mind-blowing and well-conveyed, but is it a character trait that we want to honor? But the simple answer is I want everyone to be exactly like me and do everything <laughs> that I want them to do and then thank me for it. Well, it's been established for all eternity that this is one of the most thankless tasks that you can undertake. It's not a job. It's not mandatory. Through your decisions and actions, you signed up for this. And I think this is one of the things that people most willingly ignore about parenthood is that this is an elective activity. He doesn't thank her for her sacrifices. Sure, that's absolutely true. But we never talk about the flip side. The fact that he was a thing that did not exist until her decisions and actions forced him into being, creating a consciousness that she cannot guarantee the well-being of no matter her best intentions and efforts. I guess unless you think that there's some celestial gumball machine full of souls waiting to be dispensed, and we're all somehow obligated to put a nickel in, lest they spoil, at which point, why am I even trying to have a rational discussion with you? And I think more importantly for this scene, something that actually is interesting that's happening here to me, we should address this idea of more, that it's both true and not true simultaneously. Of course there's not more, for all kinds of reasons. Life is random, it is chaos. If you don't think so, think about what you thought a year ago about what you'd be doing today or even just a month ago, or a day ago, in some cases. A whole lot more people need to be honest with themselves and get comfortable with the fact that there are accidents. And I would guess that as much as half of us walking around right now are the result of those. Looking that fact dead in the eye might disabuse you of this notion that you are special and there is inherently more for you. There's no promise of more. There's no promise of anything. That's absurd on its face. We're absurd. In retrospect, thinking about this in terms of the film, so many of life's pivotal moments seemed like nothing at the time. Why then would you ever be so deluded as to think you would recognize that there is something more to be had or is happening? And then, flipping that, if you want to go the other way, it's true. Of course there's more, if you want to look on the bright side. But you have to be angling for it and building it and creating it out of nothing sometimes and tempering your expectations of it all the time. There is definitely more. You're just not going to find it by playing along with the fiction of these roles that society has laid out for you. Doing all the right things, winning HOA's best mailbox, none of that is going to satisfy you ultimately. The other thing I think is interesting about this scene is that it works hand in glove with the restaurant scene in terms of one paying off the other unexpectedly. Maybe we don't even have this moment in her life where she feels this deep dissatisfaction if she is not given such validation from a stranger just moments before and have her children be so indifferent about it, like I said. On the plus side, the thing that you just made me think of in terms of now she's going to be by herself for the first time, good. Maybe now she can take this moment to become happy with herself, to have time to work on her and nothing but her. Her relationship choices haven't gotten her there, obviously. So maybe it's time to be alone for a while. It's just one more point, I think, of the unique process of how this film was made that makes all of this hit home in a way that's unlike traditional films. I think this may be at least in part what you were responding to. You've literally seen her age almost 20 years while you've been sitting in this seat, and subconsciously that is very powerful when all this comes home to roost. But it is boyhood after all, and in Mason's story, it's Texas in 2014. It's not 1814. The point of a life is no longer to never go more than 10 miles from where you were born and to stay right by mom's warm side your whole life. And that's where the film and I meet up again, fortunately. The point, or at least one of them, is to go out and meet your life and the things that you carry with you and how you carry them while you do that. Beautifully well put, and I feel like I've been on a roller coaster and you need <laughs> to take me for ice cream after this discussion. Ice cream is just a social construct, man. <laughs> <laughs> Don't take my ice cream away from me. I have a couple of final thoughts here, and I think that this corresponds to what you have just been eloquently talking about. Okay. And it's something that Linkletter said that it's what 
he realized, and I think we see reflected in the finality of the film, the moment seizes us. He said, I felt happy once I realized I wasn't building towards anything, that I was living my own life doing what I do. I understood that nothing had a purpose beyond its own existence. And he said it took a long time to get there, and I think we see that in the film. So the end. Few things I want to talk about before we leave the film, if that's okay. The first big one for me, how did the casting of Eller Coltrane turn out for you? I think it's lucky for the film that he turned into a cool kid. And I think that's maybe a cool kid, but maybe unremarkable in a lot of ways, which I guess is another of the reasons the movie exists. Not every person or moment is remarkable. That's life. The most important part of his being cast for me is that I believe that the two most important aspects of his character, positive and negative, live inside this kid. You see it from the very beginning when he's talking about wasps. This kid logic is on the money. You can see him puzzling it all out on his face. So both elements are established firmly in that very first scene. The inquisitiveness and interest in life's processes, good, and how it may sometimes lead him into reverie and later avoiding responsibility, sometimes not so good. It's also a nice encapsulation of both of his parents' qualities in one tiny person. He gets me to believe that he carries all of that inside him. I had never thought about it this way until I was reading more of Richard Linklater talking about it, but it was really the choice between the artistic and the regular sort of kids, the societal kids. Eller, they could kind of tell, and it turned out to be true, was the kid who did not turn out to be an athlete, the student council president, somebody who would just, by their nature, make their parents proud. So I'm kind of still on this small-scale, epic idea, the way that I see this film. What is it about Richard Linklater that he can achieve a huge film that feels mainstream but as a total outsider. I think what it boils down to in a lot of cases is that he makes hangout movies that are extremely relatable. This time we just hang out for 12 years. And it's the way that time functions as a character. It doesn't play as a stunt or a gimmick to me. He seems genuinely fascinated with the concept. And he works at the other end of the spectrum as well, frequently making films that all occur within the space of one day. The Before trilogy takes place in nine-year intervals. It's very important to him, time. He's always thinking about it, it seems like. I think he's fascinated with how people change over time. Maybe to a lesser extent how they don't change. I think he's less interested in that part, though he doesn't ignore that either. And as far as how it functions here, in the case of telling a story that represents the changes of childhood accurately, there is no better way than this unprecedented method that he used. If you want to show me between 40 and 50, that's easy enough to manage artificially. There's no way to adequately do that with a single actor between the ages of 8 and 18. And that's taking into account the physical as well as the psychological changes that you can actually see on screen. And then I really like that it adds this meta text of conceiving of and continuing to guide a project like this and that as a metaphor for parenthood with all the things you can't control and just have to let go of. I know going in the last couple of decades, I had a different view of Ethan Hawke than I do now as a performer. Has your appreciation of him changed over time? 100%. It's changed maybe more so than any other single performer I can think of. The same for me. And he still has that tinge of immaturity when it starts here. And I fought against it for a long time, but I have come to love this guy. And I think he's one of the best of his generation. First Reformed really cemented that for me. And I'm still not convinced that my earlier opinion of him was wrong necessarily. I am also of the same opinion. <laughs> he has changed as much as I have changed. That earlier pretentiousness that I perceived, there's probably a fair amount of reacting to seeing parts of myself in him that I didn't like. And it's kind of the same for me in a way for Patricia Arquette. I just didn't really care about her that much when she was younger. She's gotten infinitely more interesting to me as she's gotten older. But a slightly different case, maybe. You don't perceive her as being flawed and having gotten infinitely better. Maybe you're just catching up in terms of what you're looking for. I also think that her having children at a very young age was a formative experience. And I think that she became an adult, it seems like, overnight. 
in my eyes and continues to do incredibly challenging, interesting work as well. So is there one of the characters' journeys that you particularly identify with, if at all? Mason Sr. and being fucking lame now, maybe? Is that it? <laughs> I was going to say the least for me is probably Mason Sr. Otherwise, it's a little bit of everybody. I've talked about how, as Sam, I can kind of relate as a daughter to a mother. Yeah, I used to be cool and play music. <laughs> you still are. Now, here's the big final kind of ending. We've come full circle question. How did your feelings change about the film from 2014 to 2020? Maybe that you haven't covered. Well, I feel like I should apologize to you because like this film, I feel like I took 12 years to get my notes together and prepare to do this episode. And it's just timing, but I think I was struggling with wanting to watch it again right now. I'm not the type to say, okay, I never need to see that again. There's no place for that in my method whatsoever. The word I keep coming back to about this whole film is that it's sharpened. I haven't changed position appreciably. I feel all the same things. Some of them have just come into sharper focus, and I feel them more acutely six years later. And I'm going to just have to stop saying I don't like coming-of-age films and make it something more accurate, especially with Welcome to the Dollhouse coming up as my next selection. What I mean is I don't like the options as they've been traditionally presented to me. I love this in that there's no central galvanizing moment here. It's not lazy in the way that I think of that genre. Well, I have to say, if I'm being honest with myself, I thought there would be more with this second viewing. I ended up just not being as bowled over by it emotionally this time. I am not saying that I didn't like it as much, but I think that I'm feeling some of its holes, some of its more on-the-nose stuff that I've mentioned. And I don't think that's a bad thing, as we've talked about. And really, if we come down to it, that first viewing was just ineffably special to me, and you can't recreate that. I do have a piece of news just for you, okay. though. I don't know if you've seen this. Linkletter is doing Merrily We Roll Along. I saw that. Okay, so, and we had just watched a film about that whole production way back when. He is taking the same actors, and unlike the play itself, where young people play the parts as they age, but they don't age. It's just the single performance experience, and it's told over 20 years. These actors are going to age over the course of the 20 years. And Merrily We Roll Along is Sondheim, by the way. So we're in for something interesting. George Firth again as well. I was hoping to kind of surprise you with that, but I guess you saw it already. I keep up with my Linklater news. I'm also excited to see Apollo 10 and a half. Yeah, me too. So we're going to have to wait another 20 years <laughs> for <laughs> Merrily We Roll Along, but I'm going to be in the theater. Well, how about recommendations? Do you have something equally ineffably special? I think I do. I chose Before Midnight from 2013, also directed by Linkletter, and it's the third film in this Before trilogy. Though I've read that they might just keep going, so it might not be a trilogy anymore. In this installment, we meet up with Jesse and Celine at the end of a Greek vacation, and they're now parents to twin girls, and they're also visited by Jesse's teenaged son. It's nine years since before sunset and nine years into their relationship. This time around, they talk about the different choices they may have made and the choices that got them to where they are. Now, this series of films means a great deal to me, and I know to a lot of other people too. Each film has found me at roughly the same age in some circumstances as the characters, and I found this one especially moving. It came at a time when you and I were just starting our relationship, so it's a lot of reflection on marriage and time together. And every film has a whole lot of meat on its specific bones, and depending on where I am in my life, I find a different favorite in each one. I'm going to say epic again. This is an epic accomplishment for Richard Linkletter, for Julie Delpy and Ethan Hawke, and I'm so grateful for them for this series. I could keep touching base with Celine and Jesse wherever life takes them separately or together until the end. How about you? Well, for my recommendation this time, I chose Here Is Your Life from 1966, and that's directed by Jan Trell, 
starring Eddie Axberg and Alan Edvall. Max von Sydow is in it, too, and it's based on a series of novels by Avon Janssen and is about the coming of age of a working class kid following him from his teen years through young adulthood. It, too, is nearly three hours long and is also a sensitive treatment of a young man's evolution and the way his outlook and approach to the world at large is developed. This has more of that epicness that I think you were talking about earlier, at least how I interpret it. And I think that's mainly because Trell pulls back a little bit from his subject to include things that aren't just significant to this young man. There's a larger sense of the sweep of history here rather than just the way that time meanders like a river. And most importantly to me, and this is not a spoiler, they both end with the young man at the center of the story poised for the next step in their adventure, looking forward to whatever that is. So once again, that's two great recommendations, Before Midnight and Here is Your Life. And that brings us to the end of episode 136. If what we do here is valuable to you and you would like to support that, we would certainly love for you to check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash magiclantern. The $5 a month level gets you access to a big backlog of bonus episodes, and those come out on the Mondays alternating with regular episodes, so you never have to go a week without New Magic Lantern in your life. If you would just like to get in touch with us, you can reach us via email at magiclanternpodcast at gmail.com. We are on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search for Magic Lantern Podcast on any of those platforms. We are on Twitter at Lantern underscore casts, and I just wanted to take a second to say thanks to everyone who has shared the show or given us feedback since last time. The fine gentlemen at Fuds on Film, We Cut Heads, an excellent Spike Lee podcast, Matteo Boscarol, Justin Henry, Leanne Kubich, Mike Scharf, Andy Wolverton, Mick Erdley, Richard Sales, and Laura Cannon over at the Fatal Films podcast. If you're sharing the show or talking about us, please make sure to tag us so we can say thanks. We are on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, just about anywhere you get your podcasts, you can find us. If you'd like to leave us a rating or review via any of those services, we would certainly appreciate that. And finally, you can find all of our episodes, including supplemental material, at the website magiclanternpodcast.com. And thank you for listening to the Magic Lantern Podcast. 